Time. I need a motion turn to return to open session. Second. Second. Well, I got a motion to second. All those favor say motion saying aye. No. Aye. All those opposed like sign. Motion carries. All right, this time we're down to our public comment. We do have some public comment tonight, so I'll read the board chairman's statement before we start. Um, and the board chairman's statement states this. The public participation section of the school board meeting is designed to hear comments from the public, but is limited to 30 minutes so normal business can be conducted. During this portion of the meeting, board members will listen to concerns and comments, but will not answer questions or debate issues. Each participant is limited to five minutes and will refrain from making personal comments about personal at school personnel and board members. Okay, and coming down to our first one, uh, Ms. Crystal Fail, if you come to the podium, we'll let you start first, please. Hear me good? No. Do I need to clip it? Or? How about now? Yeah. I'm a loud talker anyway. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Crystal Fell. I'm the parent of Tristan Fell who attends Chesterfield High School. This is my first public speaking, so y'all bear with me. <laughs> I'm here today like you all because I want to see the students in our school succeed and become productive citizens within our community. On Thursday, August the 26th, a message was received on my daughter's phone while she was at home about three girls wanting to fight my daughter and two of her friends the next day at school, therefore showing premeditation. My daughter immediately made me aware of the message and at that time, as an adult, I made the necessary arrangements to take my daughter to school the next morning so I could speak to the principal, Mr. Adams. On Friday, I took my daughter to school and personally spoke to Mr. Adams before school started, making him fully aware of the whole situation to include the students' names, that the threats were coming from, and at that time, Mr. Adams told me the situation would be taken care of. My daughter was called to the office where she showed Mr. Adams the proof on her phone of messages the girls had been sending. Mr. Adams had also called the girls sending the messages into the office to ask him that they, in fact, made those threats at which time they admitted that they had in fact stated they wanted to fight my daughter and her friends. I want to bring to your attention the definition of bullying. It is willful intention to hurt, threaten, or frighten someone. Bullying can be physical, verbal, or both. Therefore, when the girls admitted to Mr. Adams in the office that they were willfully and knowingly threatened to cause physical harm to my daughter and two of her friends, it should have been taken care of at that point in time. According to the Chesterfield County Student Handbook, page 26, under category three, serious offenses, offense 34 states, threatening, intimidating, toning, or harassing another student, verbally, physically, or written. Therefore, I believe Mr. Adams, having confirmation from the individuals, should have at that time handled the situation per the sanction provided in the Student Handbook. On the same page of the Student Handbook, of three days out of school suspension, which would have handled the situation before it had time to escalate any further than it already had. Instead, the girls were told that if anything did happen, that they would be suspended and the students were then sent to class. That same Friday afternoon, I received a call from my daughter stating she was involved in a fight and she was in the office needing to be picked up. I arrived at the school and Mr. Adams met with me and proceeded to say that he had to suspend my daughter for five days for fighting. I reminded Mr. Adams at that time that he was made aware of the threats of the fighting 
and he had made confirmed that he failed to have any adult supervision at the end of the day, especially where there were a whole cluster of students gathered surrounding my daughter where the car riders stand until they are picked up. The next thing Mr. Adams made me aware of was that my daughter was involved in another fight. She would be expelled for the remainder of the school year. Points I would like to make are, we hold these students to a high standard and hold them accountable for their actions as they should be. But the adults have an even greater responsibility to do their due diligence to make sure situations are dealt with accordingly and consistently when it's trusted by our kids to get a situation handled before it comes an even bigger situation. When dealt with effectively and consistently, it sends the message to our kids that not only can they trust us, but it also sends the message that those types of behavior, although verbally made, will not be tolerated and are not acceptable. Parents and school staff can help kids prevent bullying by building a safe school environment, especially when they are made aware of the situation. I feel as though the staff at Chesterfield High did an injust injustice towards my daughter, more specifically the principal at the matter was directly discussed with him before causing my child to be put in a position that could have been avoided altogether or have potentially ended very differently as this was a premeditated plan where any one of those individuals could have had a weapon or planned jumping could have resulted in serious physical harm to my daughter. There was a real potential to have an empty seat where my daughter sits in the classroom for not just five days being suspended. It could have been permanently. Given the right circumstances, how the whole event unfolded, my daughter was outside waiting to be picked up as a car rider. Sorry. When she was surrounded by a group of individuals, the ones that made the threats and there was a no adult supervision, provoked, my daughter felt as though she had no choice but to take up for herself and defend herself given the adults that she entrusted to handle the situation failed to do so. My daughter did in fact throw the first punch as the one girl standing in front of her told my daughter that she was going to stand there and take whatever was given to her. While my daughter was fighting with the girl that was in front of her, another one of the girls came behind my daughter, striking her in the head. My child was provoked, threatened, and harassed by these individuals that had surrounded her, and she, and she had not stood up for herself, being that the situation wasn't handled by the principal before it escalated to that point, then not my daughter more than likely would be a vic victim of harsh bullying the remainder of her school years. Why did my child have to miss school because she was threatened and the situation was not handled properly by the staff? The fight was recorded by a few students, one of which was Mary Fell, a friend of the student that threatened my daughter. And she was not suspended even though she was on a video I have on my phone showing her recording before the incident even took place. According to the student handbook under category three serious offense on page 26 offense, 37, it states, inappropriate use of cell phone technology, example, filming a fight, cheating, or et cetera, shall receive three days out of school suspension for the first offense. But that was not the case in this incident. Again, failure to be consistent. Crystal, yes. uh, you went over, but I'll let you go over a little bit. Call I, I'm time. almost done. Okay. Okay. Um, three days out of school suspension for the first offense, but that was not the case in this incident. Again, failure to be consistent with the rules clearly and plainly laid out within the student handbook. Another point I would like to make is under category four, four um, severe offense, offense 50 on page 28 states, gang attack. Two or more students attack, threaten, or intimidate another student. My daughter was a victim of this with video proof where a second student hit her while she was having to fight the first individual. I was told by Brian Batson after the situation took place that an adult would be at every exit when the school let out for the remainder of the year, but that has not been implemented effectively. There is at least a 10, minute, 10 minutes after the kids are gathered outside before an adult comes out and that gives them plenty of time for another incident to occur. I ask that this school board treat my concerns with diligence and take the necessary measures to improve the avenues available for students being threatened and or bullied that my daughter was unfortunately a victim of and had to stand up for herself due to the staff, in my opinion, not taking the proper course of action when made aware of the situation. I want our kids to have faith in the system that would protect them from unnecessary situations such as the one my daughter was involved in. The safety of my child is my main priority, and I hope that the staff members at our school within our county have the safety of all students as the top priority also, but there definitely needs to be more effective system put in place to maintain the integrity of our school system. Thank you for your time.
Thank you, Crystal. Uh, administration will be getting back in. Okay, at this time, uh, next one we're going to call is public participation is Crystal LeBeau. You come to the podium, please. My name is Crystal LeBeau, and it's irrelevant what's, what my student's name is, what my child's name, or what school he goes to, but he is a minor. Um, and I don't feel like it's right that we don't get notifi notification some way of the number, at least the number and grade levels of the, of the students, not names, that are uh, being sent home either because of positive test results or to be in quarantine, regardless of if they were uh, exposed to the, to the virus inside or outside of school. This is our children. We all know that they're suffering the most from this because of the social uh, social gathering and everything, they're children. They're, they can't get the vaccine. So it's our, it's our responsibility as, adult, as an adult, as their parents and their teachers and board members that are supposed to take their, them into mo consideration the most to keep them safe. If it was another uh, aspect, we'd sure be notified if our child didn't have his homework or if he'd come to school dirty or had bruises on him, we'd be notified about that. Why can't we be notified? I don't want names. I just want numbers because it's my choice. To, that's I would use that. Me, and I can't talk to anybody else. I would use those numbers to determine whether I keep my child in school or virtual, which virtual last year was a joke. Anyway, also, <clears throat> and we're left in the dark until really it could be actually too late to, to prevent anything, uh, our child getting it. Um, also, um, when I do, uh, decide to take my child out of school, what actions are going to be taken? Am I going to be put in jail? We don't know none of this. Because I, I'm going to tell you, I'm the parent that don't care. When it comes to my child's safety, he comes first against anybody. I don't care who you are, where you are, or what your position is, or what, you, what title you hold. I don't care. That's my child. Also, we're, we, we're awarded five minutes of your time. I thought we were all supposed to be created equal. When, when are we gonna be acknowledged as respect, respected adults and be able to ask you questions and actually get an answer right then and there? Or why do we have to bow down and wait for y'all to, uh, or an administrator to contact us about a question regarding something that we find is important? How would you feel if it was your child? That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um. I put. I had two comment cards, but that's all in one. Okay. All right. Um, administration, get back with you. Uh, we do have numbers. We show every at every board meeting at the end shows those numbers. Why can't we have them at home? They're on. Every they're on the website. Thank you. All right, this time we're down to our last comment. Uh, Mr. Pat Earl is going to speak on our uh, state forest, South Carolina State Forestry Commission revenue. Then I start the clock. <laughs> <laughs> Each year I read with interest uh, the board meetings agenda for September, and I see that it's time again for the South Carolina Forestry Commission's annual donation, as they call it, I think. Um, they used to come and present a check, but I understand now I was informed that they no longer present a check, but it's still electronic. I want to give the board members just a review of some of the history that I'd like them to remember as this presentation is made. Some of the background, in 1935 through 38, the federal government began acquiring land in Chesterfield County through the Wildlife Refuge and Wildlife Management Act. Some 200 families were actually relocated or asked to relocate. <clears throat> According to Mr. James Norwood, who was the federal, federal land appraiser at the time, 
Only three families were actually relocated during this time. Under the lease agreement, 46,000 acres of this federal land would become the Sand Hills State Forest as we know it now. In 1991, the title transferred from the federal government to South Carolina. As government land, this vast acreage was removed from the tax base from which most school districts are funded. Thus, our district, more specifically the MACBE district, because at the time, the MACBE district was a completely separate school district in Chesterfield County. We had even our own separate superintendent. Mr. Uh, Leon Hendricks was the superintendent at the time. His son, Bill, by the way, this is off the record, is, uh, has a student center named after him at Clemson. He was also a MACB FFA member, by the way. <laughs> this deprived us of a significant source of tax revenue. Finally, after 18 years in 1957, the Forestry Commission was, comply, or was, was directed to comply the law that read an act to require the state treasurer to pay any county containing state forest lands a sum equal of 25% of gross proceeds received by the state of South Carolina in each physical year and other privileges of such state forest as a sale of timber, pulpwood, poles, gravel, land rentals, and any other privileges. I actually have the original draft of that document handwritten. It was introduced by Senator James Leppard in 1955 and finally passed in 1957. Representative Paul Arendt from Paisen did a lot of the work in the House on this bill. In just the past 11 years, since 2011, and including tonight's payment, this district has received approximately 5.096 million from the Forestry Commission. This year's payment of approximately 684,000 is the largest to date. That is why I'm speaking tonight to challenge each of you board members to make sure you monitor this event each year. As history teaches us, back in around 2009, a legislator from Dillon County who was also a football coach but will remain nameless, <laughs> redirected some of these funds and would have deprived this district of that year's payment. From diligent effort of our local representatives, Representative Vic, Senator Shaheen, and Speaker Jay Lucas worked to get it repaid. Then in 2011, State Forester and Secretary to the Commission, Mr. Gene, uh, Gene Kadama, brought forth a proposal to be introduced by the legislature. This proposal was that payments of what is known as our 25% be reduced over a period of time down to 7% value, as I quote him, to be in line with property taxes. He asked our previous superintendent to support this proposal. That was the only other time I ever made comments to this board, 10 years ago. If this proposal had passed, the district monies of 5.096 million collected in the last 11 years would be 1.427 million, or a decrease of 3.76 million or enough to cover almost 75 teachers. As one can surmise, be aware when someone comes to you and always says, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. I really don't think it was the intention of the spirit of the law not to provide our students in Chesterfield County School District. But if you re read all the history, and I have a lot of the original documents, the Forestry Commission has a pretty nice setup. All their land was provided at no cost, they pay no other impact fees, taxes, or any other in input. They call themselves self-sustaining. I'm sure corporate America would jump at this event. Tonight, an ele electronic chest will be presented to our school district. It is not a gift. It is a payment for the use of Chesterfield County natural resources. Just as yourself are required to pay property taxes, so are they. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Pat. Appreciate you coming. Mr. Chairman, sir. I know it's uh, improper for board members to speak after the uh, person make their presentation, but uh, since he was not making, he, he was providing information, I would like to close this out and say that it's with, through Pat Earl's father, Mr. E.B. Earl, that we are getting this far as money, who led the effort uh, in this county uh, for that. And several years ago, the school district set up a scholarship uh, in his memory of his father's name. 
So I'm glad to see that you're carrying on the tradition uh, to make sure that uh, we stay well aware uh, of this forest money because it has been a, a blessing for the school district. Thank you much. Thank you, sir. At uh, this time, we'll uh, stand for a moment of silence for the 9-11 Patriots Day Remembrance, and then we'll go into our pledge. Motion saying aye. No. Uh, opposed, like sign. Uh, motion carries. Uh, this time we're down to our special recognition, Mrs. Folsom. Good evening. Good evening. The South Carolina College and Career Ready Assessments, which we call SC Ready, are statewide assessments in English language arts and mathematics. All students in grades three through eight are required to take the South Carolina Ready. South Carolina Ready assessment items measure students' performance on the South Carolina College and Career Ready standards. SC Pass is our summative state assessment for science and social studies. This past year, science was tested in grades four, six, and eight. Social studies was given in grades five and seven. The SC Ready and SC Pass test items are aligned to our standards for each subject and grade level. Standards specify what schools are expected to teach and what students are expected to learn. The assessments are administered on, in a computer-based format only. Tonight, we are honoring the students that made a maximum, or what I like to call perfect score, in mathematics on our SC Ready. I'd like to call to the podium Liam Griggs. Liam is a student at Edwards, and he made a perfect score on his, you're in the fourth, you're in the fifth grade now, on your fourth grade math SC Red. Congratulations. Also from Edwards Elementary, Reagan Rivers, who is now at Chesterfield Ruby Middle School. Reagan made a perfect score on her fifth grade math in SC Ready. Congratulations. <laughs> from Sherall Intermediate in the fifth grade, Robert Dean Ashburn who is now attending Long Middle School in the sixth grade. Congratulations. <laughs> Don't get a, get a picture of all of y'all. <laughs> Not yet. Congratulations. If, if I could also comment, I know at least one of you had a perfect score twice. Yeah. Uh, Rivers, have anyone of you been here before? Well, we look for you next year. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, y'all.
Okay, this time we're down to our financial report. Mr. Wilder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, provided for you before the meeting the August financial review. Uh, be happy to uh, answer any questions or note any comments regarding that. All right. Not much to add to item B. Mr. Earl, thank you. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was perfect for, uh, for this evening. I appreciate you uh, giving attention to the agenda about this time of year when we uh, give a, uh, a report ourselves these days of the uh, South Carolina Forestry Revenue. Uh, I will just add a couple of things to that as far as the history, uh, as far as some of the monetary figures. Uh, he, uh, Mr. Earl uh, talked to you about the lifetime amount. Uh, I went back 10 years since I have been here, and this year's amount of just short of $684,000 is by far the largest that we have received. Uh, going back to my first year here, $604,000 was the highest up until this year, with a low of around 2015 of about $263,000. So it does show you some of the fluctuation, but it does show you, uh, despite uh, during a pandemic time, what uh, what that revenue means for us as a district. And we certainly do appreciate the Earl family for their support and dedication to that effort, and many others who have kept that uh, intact. So about $684,000 for the 2021 fiscal year. Any questions about that? Not that you can ask me the same uh, detailed questions that you could ask Mr. Earl because I can't answer all of those. All right, uh, item C, uh, Dr. Goodwin in my absence last month talked to you about a taxable bond issue that we did as a kind of joint with Skago, a little bit outside of Skago. So I wanted to give you a quick update on that. Uh, we did put out for bid uh, a three year uh, bond issuance uh, outside of Skago. The reason we needed to do that is we need to have a taxable uh, bond in place to pay for our taxable installment purchase revenue bond payments on an annual basis. Typically, we're able to issue that through Skago. However, uh, the way the markets are and the way we feel the markets are going to be for the next few years, uh, that option is not going to be available under that program. So we have gone outside of that and we have issued, it has been bid and sold and is soon to close, we have the documents being signed this evening, $597,000. Again, that'll make three years worth of payments. We did that amount of time because of the savings we could recognize. That comes at a 1.45% interest rate. And that with the issuance cost is just gonna be a little over $600,000. So it's a very good deal. We appreciate your support on that. Uh, but just wanted to give you a quick update as to what that is, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions about that if you if you have any. All right, thank you so much. That's all I have. All right, thank you, sir. Down at this time, we're down to our personnel report, Dr. Anderson. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, at this time, I'd like to recommend the following exhibits for your approval: exhibits A through F. Second. All right, I got a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, I call for the vote. All in favor say motion to say aye. Yeah. Uh, Opposed, like sign. Motion carried. All right. uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to uh, start it on B, uh, the new teacher incentive. Okay. Uh, starting back approximately four years ago, we began offering an incentive for new teachers who were coming to the district. This year we had 70 new teachers come to our district. Uh, we have not yet brought to you the recommendation for the approval of that uh, incentive or stipend that we give. We've been given $1,500 a year. So going on to approximately 70 new teachers, that would be $105,000 or after benefits and a fringe cost $137,550. Uh, we do have the funds available. These would not be federal funds because we're not allowed to use anything like ESSER for that incentive. They would come from local and uh, state funds, but we definitely do have that built into our budget. 
and we would recommend approval to uh, begin that process of giving that incentive to our new teachers. Um, so move that. I second that motion. I got a motion second on the floor. Uh, any questions? Any comments? My only comment is is that normally we give this up when they first come on board. Is that right? Yes, sir. We normally do, and quite honestly, with everything that has gone on, it got missed in the process. Okay, good. We will communicate with them immediately. Great. Anyone else? If not, I call for the vote. All the folks have motion saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, like sign. Right. Motion carries. Okay. Can you on? All right, moving forward with our problems. All right, moving forward with our uh, COVID report, COVID 19 report. So, the report that you all uh, will receive tonight is actually based on the first four weeks of the school year. Uh, and obviously, also, uh, if you don't know, on our website, we actually have the prior week or the previous week posted as well on the COVID 19. But the, the, the first uh, few slides, this is exactly what it looks like on our website. Um, weekly, again from the previous week, week one, week two, week three, and week four. And just to add a little context to that, as you see, we have uh, it broken down by area, weekly totals. Uh, so uh, when we look at Sherrard area, at this point, at this time, we have 1,992 students in the Sherrard area. 1,685 students in the Chesterfield area, total students, that is. 1,064 students in the <coughs> Mac Plain View area, and 1,716 students in the Pageland Jefferson area. So just to add a little context to the numbers. It looks, well, based on uh, our data, obviously we've all had, across our country and state, had some uh, rough weeks. Looking at staff positives, week three, as you'll see, was our toughest week. 14 being the highest number for staff positives over the four week period. Last week was a little better, it was a shortened week, but it was still a little better. Staff quarantines, week two being our highest week. But again, last week was was the lowest at this point. Hopefully we'll be able to continue that trend, hopefully. Student positives, a total week five, uh, week three again, a total of 120 for that week was our highest. <clears throat> Drop, dropped almost by half, 50% on last week. Student quarantines, Huge gap between week three and week five, week four. Look at daily highs, some just some daily uh, numbers as far as highs for the day or daily highs. We actually had five staff positive cases in one day. That's a high. Thirty-eight student positive cases in a day. Those came during week three, which is that very high week. Six staff quarantines uh, in one day and 345 student quarantines in one actual day. So that was a high. Hopefully, that won't be challenged anymore. As far as the weekly highs, uh, we had 14 staff positive cases <clears throat> for the week. Then that was a high 120 student positive cases. Week three, that was during week three. 16 staff quarantines and 1,276 student quarantines during week three. Uh, any questions? When, when are these, when do we upload these numbers to the district website? Uh, e uh, every Monday morning every Monday or the morning. first day of the week. <clears throat> and it's only done by area, so it's not going to be broke out by school. No, sir. Just by the area. No, sir. It'll look just like um, the, this. Okay. By, by area, okay. not by school. 
I was going to go to the parking lot if I needed to and see if we could answer it. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question, um, and I guess this is for the superintendent. Um, do you have any authority at all as superintendent for school that's in a pretty high uh, quarantine positive rates? And I'm thinking of one that's in the Sherrill area where we had to close down nine classrooms. Uh, do you have any authority with DHEC to say, I think we need to close this school down and do virtual school? Actually, uh, just last. Thursday, DHEC offered some guidelines that we can consider in, in that area. Um, they, they had some different percentages that we look at on both positive and quarantines, as well as staff. Also, if we get to a point where we do not have enough staff to operate, I can appeal directly to the state superintendent for the authority to move to an e-learning day. And that has been done in other districts. That has been done. If you follow your clippings, you, you know, you've noticed that's gone on in different spots. They will not approve for, say, a area or a district to close. You have to make the appeal on a school by school basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also incentive to the staff to uh, take the back. Uh, we did not offer any incentive for. Uh, staff or students take the vaccine. With the president's speech about those companies and agencies that are receiving federal dollars, that does not apply to the public school system. Does not appear that it applies under the Ombudsman Act. Um, that is actually being looked at by the State Department of Education. They're supposed to give us a ruling on that soon. Also, Mr. Chair, what, what is the percentage of our faculty and staff that has received the vaccine? 80%. It's 80% now? Oh, it's 80%. Okay, that's an increase in the, since the last time we talked. Yeah. yeah. 6 to 9, 80. Yeah. That's 80% of eligible students and staff that can be vaccinated. Staff. It's just staff. Oh, yeah. do, do, we, do we have any monitor on student vaccinations? We do not have any data on that. We don't. Uh, I would add that we will be working with DHEC to do uh, student, family, and staff uh, vaccination clinics again. Uh, the first one will be at Pageland Elementary School in the gymnasium. Um, Mr. Bassett, you know the date off the top of your head. I've been talking about this. It's probably going to be the last Saturday of this month or the first one of October. And then they will rotate among the other four areas. And they will give incentives for students who come, like gift cards, those kinds of things, they'll do drawings and raffles uh, as part of their program. Anyone else? Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. This time we're down to our superintendent report. Good. I'm Good sorry, room. I'm sorry, Ms. Foles, I apologize. <laughs> Critical <laughs> report, Miss Folsom. I'm sorry. That's all right. I've already been up here one time. <laughs> Good evening, members of the board, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Good evening. On our agenda, we have our local board approved courses for 21 22. You received those in your packages. The district administration recommends approval for all of these courses. So moved. Okay, we got a motion to second on the floor. Any, any discussion? Any added courses? Any added courses from last Not year? Not for this year. Okay. Uh, any other questions? If not a call for vote. All those in favor say motion to say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Right, motion carries. In your August 21 curriculum report, I want to point out a few things. We have an e-learning practice day this Thursday, September 16th. Um, we gave an explanation of what an e-learning practice day is, and I hope that it's not confusing our students. Students will come to school as normal, but they will get to practice on their devices as if they were home for an e-learning day. They'll have support from their teachers, support from our instructional staff, um, 
and our instructional technology staff on that day. They can learn how to upload materials, they can learn where to find the materials that they would need to be working on on an e-learning day. Throughout the month of September, we are going to be nominating students in grades three through five for our gifted and talented program. Schools were sent the brochure along with a cover letter explaining the process for nominations. The GT committee will review the nominations and those students nominated will be considered for additional aptitude testing. All second graders will be assessed for the gifted and talented program in October with COGAT. We are gonna run an abbreviated academic bowl season this year. Teams will be practicing, begin practicing in September with matches scheduled to begin in late October. The academic bowl coordinators suggested that this year's matches be held without spectators and that we do not host an end of the season banquet in January. We are hoping that we will be able to get four matches in for each team. A schedule will be shared later this month once we have it solidified. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Dawson. Thank you. <coughs> and this time we're down to the superintendent report, Dr. Gill. Okay, um, school opening, obviously. Um, we, we were getting ready to open the last time we met. Little did we realize how crazy things would, would spiral there those first few days. Um, I will say that, you know, when we look at the quarantines, those numbers do look extremely high and they put us sort of stepping back. But we have to also remember that was the last tool that was given to us. Um, you know, things like hybrid schedules, we no longer have um, a number of the other things, the low capacity on school buses, all of that was removed from uh, the superintendent of education, state superintendent's uh, powers. So we basically, the only thing that she was left with uh, was the DHEC quarantine. Uh, that really gets confusing, and we are actually bringing back in all of our folks to talk that through because it gets very complicated as to why one student looks like they got a 14-day quarantine and another one gets a 10-day and another one gets something else. But each case has to be done on a contact-by-contact on contact basis. But we're going to be going back through that again in an effort to create some better communication with parents when their child is, is involved. Uh, so we will be doing that in the very near future, as in immediately. Uh, because with the new information that has come out, uh, it, it is only clouding the issue more, I'm afraid. And we need to make sure that we're quarantining the right students and not ones that we should. We do have a September 27th board uh, work session scheduled uh, for here at PLC. Uh, we will do the uh, 2021 data review from the state school report card and then also we will uh, give you some details on the state academic recovery plan that had to be in place before we started this school year, which is one of the, uh, the, the qualifiers for the ESSA 3, ESSA 3 money is that plan has to be approved. So uh, we will be bringing that information. Mr. Chair, I think that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Dr. Gillen. All right, now under uh, Chairman's comments, uh, first thing we got is the Educational Advisory School uh, Council appointments. We need to do those. I recommend you have those. Uh, we, we have given you a few new members in the MACB area. We are really in desperate need of Asia uh, Jefferson and uh, one or two in Sherrall, but a large number in Chesterfield. So. If you know someone who might be willing to serve, we would love to bring those back to you for approval next month. Do you have any who you send that to? Yes, we do have uh, Ms. Opal Pons and Ms. Cynthia McCormick for the MACD Patrick area. We need, need a motion to approve. So moved. Second in motion. Got a motion and a second. All in favor say motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Moving on down to our next time, we're down to our Skisbit, uh, Michigan Business Seminar will be October 20th through 22nd. Uh, the deadline for sign up is September 20th. Ms. Patson knows we plan on attending. 
Uh, of course, what we just went over September 27th will be our board workshop here at Family Learning Center. Uh, October 11th will be our next board meeting. It'll be at New Heights Middle School, 5:30, and five will start. We'll start at five with executive session. Um, and lastly, uh, the delegation for the South Carolina School Board Association Delegate Assembly will be December 4th. The deadline is November 12th. We need to have some, need to see who's going to go to the duck to be a delegate for us at the uh, assembly. Do you want to plan on going? What day is that now? Sir. Yeah, I'm going. Mr. Mr. Young, and I'm attending risky business also. Okay. You going to Dr. Chapman? Yeah. Going to just both? So Teal and Dr. Chapman's going to both? I'm going to the D7. You going to the delegate? Mr. Dix is going to the delegate? Mr. Coleman? Yeah, delegate. Mr. Coleman going to the delegate? Question mark beside me. I just don't know yet. Yes, sir. I said question mark beside me. No, I'm not going. Okay, I know you had something to say. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay, so we got we got enough people to uh, attend that. So I think we got our, got our names down. Anybody else? Yeah, I see it. Okay. All right, this time, we'll, since there's no other business, we'll have I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. A motion second. All those in motion, aye. Aye. Opposed, right side. Motion carries. Thank you for your attendance tonight.